morning, everyone. Welcome to the Google Cloud Next Developer Keynote. Please give it up for your hosts, Richard Soroder. <laughs> and Chloe Condon. Hello, everybody. Welcome to the next 2024 Developer Keynote. I'm Richard Sroder, the Chief Evangelist here at Google Cloud. And I'm Chloe Condon, a Chief Developer Relations Engineer for Google Cloud. Yeah, we made it. Yes, we're here in Vegas in a room full of developers who build, run, and operate software using Google Cloud. Yeah, and some shout outs to some developers, our champion innovators over there. <laughs> yeah. Some folks from my team, don't behave yourselves during this time. That's what I'm talking about. And uh, all of you joining online, thank you so much for calling in. So look, just eight months ago, thousands of you joined us in San Francisco for our previous developer keynote. That was a good time. We learned from Google experts. We saw Google's latest technologies, which was great, and celebrated what a legacy looked like in the modern world. Speaking of 2023, mm -hmm. we took last year's developer keynote video and we used the latest Gemini 1.5 Pro model to extract some information from it. Here were all the things that we wanted to know. When did we actually do a demo? Did we talk about BigQuery? Who was the chief tuba innovator? I have some questions about that. I've got that. questions, yeah. <laughs> Did anyone talk about RAG? Before coming on stage, we loaded up the video and prompted it with a few questions and sped it up a bit. Yeah. It's 75 minutes of high definition video. Yeah, let's see what we got. So if you look at the insights that we got back from this, it's actually pretty good. Like it kept track of the different questions across the video time, answered different types of questions, and even found some names. Miles, like look at that. So look, it's cool that we actually are showing product a little faster than last year as well. I'm kind of glad we didn't ask any questions about that absurd musical intro, but we love Forest. <laughs> Developers can use our Gemini 1.5 Pro model to get insights on things like code bases with over 30,000 lines of code, extract information from 11 hours of audio files, or even a doc with 700,000 words. It's like one email from my boss, Gabe. It's amazing. It <laughs> all fits. Uh, super cool. So look, the pace of innovation is speeding up, though, and you all are building some amazing things right now. At Google Cloud, we want to meet you where you are, but frankly, take you further than anybody else can. The future of development is giving you smarter tools to build smarter apps that run on smarter platforms. I think Gemini is changing the way developers deliver software, and we are here to prove it to you today. So we're going to show you how Gemini makes coding better, we're going to show you how it makes platforms better, and we're going to show you how you make ops better. This next developer keynote is made by developers for developers. So yeah. let's get moving. Awesome. Yeah, we got to get you out of here in 60 minutes or Allison's going to yell at me again. So we've got a jam-packed morning, so we should get rolling. Yes, I'll get some of our cool demos ready while you introduce our first guest. Love it, thanks, Chloe. So I'm pumped to invite someone on stage to show us generative AI for the developer across the entire cloud experience. So give me a big Vegas welcome to Vice President and GM of Google Cloud, Brad Calder. Get you off this stage. Yeah, back again. Back again. Thanks, Richard, and, and welcome, everybody. So, yesterday we heard Thomas talk about a new way to cloud. We are helping customers build AI agents and applications. And in today's keynote, we're going to see how developers can accomplish this. But first, I want to talk about a few products I'm excited about. I know you are. Where do we start? Okay, let's start with Gemini Code Assist. This is our cornerstone product for developing applications with AI assistance. Yep. It helps developers build applications in their favorite IDEs, languages, and environments. And we're making Gemini Code Assist even better by integrating the power of Gemini 1.5 Pro. This upgrade brings a massive 1 million token context window, which is the largest in the industry. It is. Yeah, I mean, this, I think, revolutionizes how we all do coding. All of a sudden, you can look at your whole code base and add new features, do version upgrades, even comprehensive code reviews. Makes it all much better. Yeah, exactly. And you'll see Code Assist used throughout the whole keynote today. Awesome. So love assisted development. You know that. But you've also been leading some pretty transformational work on how people run and operate their software. What do you have? Yeah. And for that, I want to talk about something completely brand new. 
Let's do it. So yesterday we released Gemini Cloud Assist. Gemini Cloud Assist makes it easier to design, operate, troubleshoot, and optimize your application. It uses the context from your cloud environment, knows about your specific cloud resources, and helps manage your application lifecycle. Yeah, I need help in big ways uh, troubleshooting apps. You know this. I'm not good at this. Yeah, and that's one place where Gemini Cloud Assist shines. Love it. By leveraging the specific context of your application, it'll help you, Richard, solve problems like troubleshooting. When you have a production issue, every minute counts. It's true. And Cloud Assist helps you uncover the root cause so that you can solve problems in minutes instead of hours. OK, so let's get to a demo and demonstrate Cloud Assist in action. Yep. And for that, I'd like to invite Jason Davenport here to help us out. Brad, I think Richard broke the internet. That's not surprising. Not surprising at all. All right. So we're here at our application page because we're working for Symbol Shops, and something's definitely wrong. So I can't buy clothes, I can't buy couches. We got to get this fixed, right? And we got to do this as fast as possible. Yeah, we're all counting on you. Uh, no pressure, right? All right. So here's what's fun, right? This is where we're going to use Gemini Cloud Assist to help us root cause this problem really quickly. So I'm going to open up the Cloud Console here. And I'm going to start by asking Gemini to show me recent alerts for Symbol Shop app, which is the app that we just looked at. And by the way, I'm terrible at actually typing on this, so. You are terrible at that. I'm absolutely right. terrible. <laughs> yeah. All right. So what's really cool about this, right, is that Gemini Cloud Assist knows about all of our project features here, right? It knows about our run times, it knows about the health, and it knows specifically what's in it. And all this is because we're using App Hub to power this new experience, which is now generally available. Yeah, and what's cool here is that App Hub tracks your application's resources and dependencies. Mm -hmm. Right, and I actually now have a lead on this problem. So what we're doing is we're getting our application and service back, but I'm going to go ahead and click into this incident to see what's actually going on. So here, I'm actually looking at an incident summary page, which summarizes our problem. So it looks like we have a, a 503 problem with one of our load balancers. Now, we know we've seen some network problems before, and I'm not ready to blame Richard for this quite yet. Not yet. Not yet, but we should probably dig in a little bit more and see what's going on. So I'm going to go ahead and click View Logs. And sure enough, that's a lot of 503s. So to make this a little bit easier, what I'm going to do is just open one of these, and then I'm going to actually use Explain This Log Entry, which will help summarize all of these JSON elements here and just make it a little bit easier to consume. Yeah, that's fine. I figured JSON would be better at JSON, but that's uh, not a big deal. <laughs> I'll be quiet now. Just ruthless today. I'll Absolutely ruthless. It's fine. All right. So it looks like we got something back, right? And there is a load balancing problem that we have. But let's, let's really see something cool here, right? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to ask Cloud Assist to troubleshoot the load balancer for the error above. And what's going to happen after a few seconds is Gemini is going to start doing the things about figuring out what's going on with all of my network paths and, quite frankly, things that I would probably be in 10 screens to figure out what's going on with. And I actually get back a direct answer here, which saves me a lot of precious time and pain trying to diagnose what would be wrong with this otherwise. Yeah, and as you can see, once again, this advice is specific to your cloud environment. Yeah, and that actually makes a huge difference, right? Because we can see that we have a firewall issue in this specific project. So what I do want to make sure of, you know, let's see when this actually happened, right? So I'm going to go in here, and I'm going to ask it to also show me recent changes to the firewall. And what's cool about this is that we're going to query all the assets in our project to understand what were the things that are in there, and then when were those changes actually made, because we do actually have a pretty big audit trail for this. So the firewall is down again? OK, how did that happen? I'm Every demo. I know. I change things a lot. We're going to revoke Richard's owner access after this. Yeah. All right. We do actually have a problem, right? So let's, let's figure out what we need to do to back this out, because we want to make sure that we can actually sell things on the internet, right? That's our, our whole goal. For me. All right. So the next thing I'm going to do here, because we can see this, is I'm going to go ahead and ask you just what is the command to remove the firewall rule above? And so, Richard, you also get the postmortem. Yeah, I'm going to use Gemini to do the postmortem. I think it actually works. Good Soon, idea. right? 
All right. So we get back at Command here, right? This is cool. Now, even though we're having a little fun, right? Just call out. We should obviously check with our team, make sure that this is actually the right thing to do. Um, but once we have done that, let's assume we have, let's go ahead and then fix this. So I'll go ahead and hit copy to Cloud Shell here, which actually opens up an editor, and I have my command already in here, and you can see that it already has the context of the specific rule that we're gonna get rid of. And what I'll do is just go ahead and hit enter, and then I'll go ahead and hit yes, and then this will come back here in a couple of seconds, and we'll have our problem resolved. Yeah, it's amazing. That's a game changer, right? We got to the root problem really quickly, entirely in chat. This saves you a significant amount of time. Whether you're an expert like Jason, whether you're new or terrible at this like me, it's all fine. We put Jason on the clock there because this matters, right? Every second you're offline, it impacts the business. So great job, Jason, on that one. So let's Thank switch you. gears. Yeah. Yeah. Here's happy that things are working. It's a low bar. There we go. Um, look, we saw how you'd use Gemini to help manage applications. That's great. But how else are we bringing Gemini to the entire developer experience for clouds? Yep, exactly. Cloud user. Exactly. So in Google Cloud, you expect world-class data services, and now we're extending the AI journey to, for developers by bringing you Gemini and BigQuery. With this, developers can build amazing analytics applications and data agents with the help of rich multimodal AI. In addition, we're making it easy to use Gemini with your data in real time with continuous queries in BigQuery. Yeah, I love those. That feels like a big deal. I think most of us know doing real-time analytics has never been particularly easy. Yeah, and that's why I call it BigQuery. Gosh, I'm rubbing off on you in a bad way. Yes, you are. Not good. <laughs> so Jason, please show us an example of building a real-time analytics application in BigQuery. All right. So. Let's say that we're uh, working at Symbol Shops because we just got our website back up. Thank you, Richard. <laughs> All right, what we're doing here is we're gonna analyze social media trends so that we can actually keep up with this and detect these trends in real time so we can respond to them and do things like you know, marketing analysis or maybe you know, marketing trends and campaigns. Now for this, what we need to do is actually build a real-time pipeline. So real-time in this case being that we can take our social media comments we can extract things like topics, sentiment, and products, and then we can actually give this to our marketing team and our other data teams to use downstream. And what's really cool here that we're gonna get into is how we can do this all from BigQuery using, with the help of Vertex AI, but with the new continuous queries feature. Yeah, I love that. Is this the tool you use to pick out those sweet kicks you got today? I mean, these things are cool, right? Yeah, those yeah. Google fault Cloud Shoes. Nice. You can't fault it. Love it. All right. So let's go ahead and get this built, right? So the first thing I'm here, I'm just in the BigQuery helm. We can see that I actually have a few things here for my social media that I'm pulling in. I have this social media post page here. So let's go ahead and just query a few records to make sure that we're getting some data in. Okay, that's pretty cool, right? We have some stuff here from different platforms and some post text, but now is where we really need to actually get our work started, right? So what we're gonna do is open a new editor And we're gonna go here and we're gonna actually use uh, Gemini Pro to both analyze our topics and sentiment, and we're gonna use Gemini to actually help us write this query for it, right? Nice. So I'm gonna go ahead and hit this here. I'm gonna come in to write a SQL statement. And what we're gonna do is ask Gemini to essentially build us something where we have a prompt that can extract sentiment, topics, and product mentions from post text in the social media post table and then we want this in JSON output, no JSON pun intended, for our next step, which we'll show here in a minute. And I'll go ahead and run this. And what we can do here is see that we're actually getting back different things. And what's great here is that it's helping me with different things in SQL syntax, like different functions and things that can actually be really difficult to remember if we're working across all these other databases for it. Yeah, and that's a lot to remember to, and to get right that Codasys helps you with. Yeah, getting the right statement figured out is not easy. So I love the natural language. It's yeah, it's great. All right, so now that we have this, let's go ahead and add it to our editor. And just to make sure it works, uh, we'll go ahead and, and get a, a small piece here on a subset of our data. So I'll just go ahead and run with the limit 10. And we can see here, once we have this popped up, that we have essentially the message in the payload that we want. And we also have some results from the LLM on that social media post table. 
And what's really cool is that in two things, this function call and then this prompt statement here, is that's how we're actually calling Gemini Pro to get all of this LLM richness on our data. Mm. All right. So we have these things, we have them in JSON, now we're ready for the next step. Yeah, so how do we actually do this continuously? All right, so here's the part, Brad, that's gonna be really cool. <laughs> so to get this to run continuously over data, there's a couple of things. First, what I'll do is I'll remove the limit, and then I'll take this, this prompt here because you know, we're not get, it's not gonna know everything about what's in my head that has to get onto the keyboard. <laughs> so I'll go ahead and, and augment this a little bit with some, some additional things, and now what I'm gonna do is turn this into a continuous query. And for that, the first thing we're gonna do is come over to more, we're gonna do query settings, I'm gonna check this box for use continuous query mode, great name, and then I'm gonna select my service account, and then we have it running. Did you catch that? Yeah, I mean, that, that looks easy, it's just a checkbox, but there's a lot of engineering magic that the team built to, to do that, right? You're enabling real-time data pipelines in BigQuery, and it's fully managed by BigQuery. What's left? All right, so I promise there are only two steps, right? Yeah. Me Hold me to it. Here's what we're gonna do for the second step, right? We're gonna come in here, and the last piece that we're gonna do is with four lines of SQL, we're gonna actually set up this, this whole process to run on our data in real time, extract all those things that we talked about from the LLM, and then send all of these results to our event handler, in this case PubSub, so that our applications and data teams can subscribe to this in real time. Nice. And all that I need to do is hit run. Yeah, this makes it so easy to build a real-time processing engine. Yeah. All right. And now we're running continuously, right? Super cool. Yeah. And the last thing that we want to do, just to make sure, right, that you know, this is running, running on our stuff, is I'll go ahead over here. We have some different results. I'll go ahead and hit run. And we can see that we're actually getting a, a lot of data back, which is really cool. So we can see that I have you know, my post IDs, which are the new ones. I have some different sentiment. I have topics, and I have products as a part of that. And since all this is going downstream to our event bus, we could actually do things like find you know, trends in all of this data and do more offline type of analysis or multimodal analysis with BigQuery and Vertex AI. Yeah. Thanks, Jason. So the two demos Jason just showed us use several features across our Gemini for Google Cloud portfolio. This provides a new generation of AI assistants and capabilities for building AI applications and agents with Google Cloud. And this is just the beginning, and there's so much more to come. Yeah, that was amazing. Looking forward to the rest of it. Brad, Jason, thank you for showing off Gemini across Google Cloud, helping us see how we can make the entire development and software experience better with Gemini. Back to you, Chloe. Thanks, y'all. Now we're gonna dive deep into how to build, run, and operate with Gemini. The first stop on our journey is how to go from a great idea to an immersive, inspirational AI app in just a few minutes using Google AI and Google Cloud. To help me get started here, please welcome Google Cloud Product Manager, Femi Akinde. Hello everyone, how's everyone doing? <laughs> Femi, generative AI seems so simple yet difficult, especially when we try to make our idea a real application. So let's create some inspiration. I was inspired by a developer community video that used Gemini to identify and categorize a bookshelf. But how can we turn this into activation? Well, Chloe, a lot of your books feature very interesting travel destinations. But you and I both know LLMs, LLMs are trained on a lot of general information. So can we get Gemini to recommend fantastic places to travel based on the books you've read? Great question. Let's load it into Google AI Studio and see if this will work. Here we have a video of the books on my shelf, and I want to go somewhere in Europe. Let's ask Google AI Studio to recommend places to travel in Europe based on the locations in my bookshelf that I have here. A, multi a multimodal model like Gemini offers so much power 
to classification and recommendation scenarios like the ones we have here. Okay, our prompt is back and this is cool. We have a few recommended places based on our books. Simple travel itineraries are so 2023 though. Let's get recommendations and let people do things like book travel. Google AI Studio was great because we proved that we could use multimodal input to get place recommendations. Since we want to build an application, we need to shift over to Google Cloud to build it out, which gives us more enterprise-grade controls and capabilities. And since we're going to write some code, we'll need an IDE to code in. So, Chloe, could you please go over to Cloud Workstations from Google Cloud? Sure. Here you can use a hosted and managed development environment that provides developers their IDE of choice. This is great. I can see there's a VS Code workstation, so let's go ahead and open that. It's great that in under a minute, we've moved from validating our idea to being ready in our IDE, which means now we can code. And we'll need an application framework for that, one that's highly responsive and dynamic to give our users a great experience. We also want it to be highly integrated with our hosting platform. So let's use Next.js to build a great user experience and minimize our code. Let's build it. Let's do it. Great, and for that, I met a great expert on Next.js backstage. I'll pass the mic to him, and he'll help finish this off. Thanks, Femi. Thank you, thanks for having me. I'm Bye, everyone. Bye. <laughs> I'm sure our audience would love to see this in action, so let's bring one of the creators of Next.js on stage to show us how it's done. Please welcome the CEO of Vercel, Guillermo Rausch. Thanks for joining us at Next. Thank you, Chloe. <laughs> Happy to be here. So let's say I'm building an app with Next.js, and I want to start including AI in my development process. What do I need to think about? Our goal at Vercel is to make it very easy to create and publish applications on the web. We developed the AI SDK to simplify adding AI to any web application. All you need to know is React, Svelte, or Vue. If you're creating an Next.js app, you just need to bring in the AI SDK, your idea, and your model of choice, Gemini. It lays the foundation for the next wave of AI-native user experiences. Like a chatbot? Well, just over a year ago, we saw the first generation of AI chat. You could write a rap song or a poem and get help with homework. Uh, but the models were only as smart as the information they were trained on. So they couldn't answer real-time questions like, what's the weather in Vegas? Not a great experience. So developers quickly got around this limitation. With retrieval augmented generation, along with tools and function calling, we made our AI applications more powerful and reliable. Developers could now give language models more contextual information about the outside world and use them for reasoning rather than just next word prediction. RAG allowed chatbots to move beyond their training sets. So we're done. Well, not quite. Look, if you're telling me that we've spent trillions of dollars on GPUs and training and all we got was 1995 style plain text user experiences, <laughs> we're not done. So. Text is sometimes useful, but the reason we've invented as an industry technologies like React and Next.js is to make interactive, intuitive user experiences. With the Vercel AI SDK, we aim to tackle this problem head on. With our latest release, we allow developers to move beyond plain text chatbots to create rich, interactive, component-based interfaces that we believe will be the future of AI-powered user experiences. At Vercel, we believe this is the future, and we call this generative UI. I see what you did there. <laughs> so let's take your starting point of books that help us plan travel, which is a great use case for LLMs. So as you can see here, we have our repo with an XJS chatbot, of course. It's built with the Vercel AI SDK, already running, as well as some basic code from Gemini. Let's make this interactive with the ability for users to select their destination, pick flights, seats, and even pick hotels. Great. How would we do that using tools and responsive components? All right, so first, we focus on our actions.tsx file over here. So this file has a React server action that calls the Gemini model using the Vercel AI SDK 
to get a response. So for more information about everything in the file, you can use Gemini Code Assist to explain the file. So this helps break down everything that happens here so you can read and translate programming concepts. To make our app, we have components for listing flights. We have components for choosing seeds. And because we're using the AI SDK with Next.js, these are regular React components, which means I get all of the benefits of using React. So instead of simply returning a result, we define a series of React server actions which use Gemini. So this does two things. Number one, we can now dynamically fetch external data for the user. Number two, we can pass that data and return it into React components to render. That makes building this app pretty easy. So let's say this is ready to go, and we deploy it. Can we try it out? Yeah, so let's go through the flow. OK. All right, so let's highlight the components. You have a recommendation, and you want to go to Rome. So when I ask to book a flight to Rome, we get this awesome flight list Ooh. built in a React component instead of boring text, of course. So the component is streamed on demand, so it doesn't blow the JavaScript bundle with lots of client-side code. And when I select the flight, even better, it calls Gemini again with a React server action. So this time, Gemini decides to call the show seat picker tool which gets the user current seat, but also lets them change it. So remember when we said that we could do better than just text? Mm -hmm. So we're doing that here, mixing both text and React components to make something truly immersive. So when I go to change my seat, my selection can be made available back into the model. We could even build checkout and boarding pass React components to demonstrate the kinds of useful, stateful, and even agent-like experiences that are now possible even integrating other Google APIs like flights or payments. This is so rad. I can't wait to share this with others so they can book personalized travel experiences from books. I have to say this is a really great experience. And as we continue to improve it, our code is automatically built and published as a Vercel app. Incredibly fast, secure, and available around the world. We're excited to help move the needle here through the Vercel AI SDK and Next.js and unlock generative UI for everyone. Great. I'm so excited to see what new experiences developers will use these tools for. Everybody, give it up one more time for Femi and Guillermo. Thank you so much. We just showed you how to take your AI application from idea to reality quickly using Google Cloud and partners like Vercel. We also showcased why multimodal models unlock so many possibilities and how function calling makes LLMs even more impactful for end user experiences and shared how AI charge frameworks like Next.js help simplify the development process with support from Gemini models. Now we're gonna pass things over to Richard to cover the next step of delivery with AI, getting things running and deployed. Thank you, Chloe, that was awesome. Yeah, clap for Chloe, that's good. Uh, so that was a great look at developing with AI. Now to help us talk through running and improving our production AI apps, please help me uh, welcome Google Cloud Developer Advocate, focused on running things at scale, and she's the co-host of the Kubernetes podcast, Kaslyn Fields. Awesome. See, you got more claps than Chloe on that one. That's nice. <laughs> Uh, so, Kazan, look, I need a production-grade generative AI agent or app. How do I make it? That is the question of the moment, isn't it? Let's dive in. Okay. So, a generative AI agent is essentially an app stack like any other. But I'll show you the differences as we go. In that previous segment, we saw that some front-end code talked to a fully managed Gemini endpoint. That's what we were messing around with. But now we want to look at a different full-stack application in action with all those different pieces, including the model itself. Can we break it apart and then talk about all the cool stuff? For this demo, we're going to build a better chat experience for Symbol Shops. Okay. Using generative AI enables Symbol Shops to provide product recommendations based on images of the customer's own home. In the app, the customer can open the chat agent, which is right here. And here in the chat agent, you can provide an intent-based prompt like, what would look good in my room? 
question. And then we can upload an image of the space. <laughs> Why is that called Richard's dining room? <laughs> it's creeping me out. It's white. They, I, I picture, I look like a serial you... killer. <laughs> what kind of room is that? Gosh. It's actually my living room. Yeah. <laughs> it looks great. So here, the agent is analyzing the media to detect what currently exists in the room. And based on the items that it sees, along with our available inventory of items, it recommends the top items that the customer might want to purchase. All right, that's really cool, but then how did this actually happen? What did you do here? So we used a multimodal model for our chat, but the key is customizing it to understand Symbol Shop's catalog. And we do that using Retrieval Augmented Generation, or RAG. And here's the user flow. Okay. To analyze our image, get our products, and then create the top recommendations for the user. Okay, so let's show developer what, developers what this looks like. They can see what's familiar, what's new for anyone building this kind of software. Building these types of apps will be more familiar than you might think. By the way, you all can deploy the demo that we just shared if you wanna check it out. Let's talk about the components of our system. Okay. You can think of these like services in a modern app stack. Here are the main logical components. Data ingestion, which we use to get data, calculate embeddings, and store embeddings as vectors in a vector database. Serving, where we receive prompts, call the LLM, and validate responses. And quality, where we continuously evaluate the actual performance of the LLM. And then we connect everything together in a vector database like AlloyDB. When you take these top-level items and then show what Google Cloud products we actually use, it very quickly looks like a common application architecture, except that this one serves a great generative AI experience for our end users. Yeah. Yeah, what I love about this is it can be as complicated or as simple as you need it to be based on the use case. Exactly. And we've published an architecture, if you want to read up more in our architecture center, to use this pattern for your own use cases. All right, so there's a lot there, but let's drill into two of the key components, the model and the database. What can you tell me about what you picked and how they work? With all the choices out there, it's important for our dev community to understand the options and the opinions. We picked Gemini for our LLM because multimodality is really needed for this use case. Next, let's talk about the database, which is kind of the glue between all of these systems. Sure. Almost all the databases here at Google Cloud have some level of vector and embedding support. We picked AlloyDB because it has vector support, it's four times faster than regular Postgres in transactional workloads, and we're already using it. So this makes it easy for us to focus on the chat experience. I'm completely shocked that you picked Gemini. That was, uh, didn't see that coming. But actually, the most curious thing I have is with the database. How does that really support RAG? We've heard about it, but can you show this in action? Yeah. Let's pull up the database in the new AlloyDB Studio, where I can connect to my instances databases in the Google Cloud console. So in here, the first thing that we'll look at is in our product table. If I run this command that I already have up here, well, query, <laughs> you can see that it shows me the product information. And some of this information is also the vector embeddings, the vector representations of our product descriptions. And these vectors can represent text or image meaning in the same vector space. Okay, so what you're saying is that when I wanna find related meaning across data, I can kind of search across images and those product descriptions in a single query. You got it. I learn quick. Next, let's look at how we can quickly search for products using a query with vector search. So in this query, I'm searching for rec a recommendation based on my natural language input, which is here. So AlloyDB has its direct connections to Vertex AI so that it can manage the process of converting my language in this query into an embedding. Then it searches all of the embeddings in the database to find similarities. And lastly, it returns the top three relevant products. So this is a way that we can use RAG. Yeah, makes that room look better. Uh, I love how simple yet scalable all this is in a single database engine. That's great stuff. Now tell me how we wire this up for serving. I gotta serve this out. So for our infrastructure, we're using GKE, AKA Kubernetes, because we already use it for our web app. And specifically, we're using GKE Autopilot. So it automatically scales based on user demand. 
We can also deploy clusters and services across different regions as we expand our global reach. Last, let's talk about the application framework. Okay. For that, I'm going to tag in someone whose app dev work I really admire. Please help me welcome Spring Developer Advocate from Broadcom, Josh Long. All right. Thank you, Kevin. <laughs> let anybody in here. Good to All see right. You. Good to see you. Uh, look, we don't have a ton of time, so I want to talk about applications and fast applications and you know fast AI applications. Can you help? Absolutely, Richard. I want to tell you why Spring is the best way to run any Java uh, thing in production. And what we just did to make it easy to run Spring with Gemini and Vertex. That's great. Super cool. So I have a scenario for you. We just saw from Caslin, it's kind of AI powered. We saw chat, we saw these other things, we saw UI. But what about when oh, I need scale? I want an API, right? I want to have partners and app builders use that. And while we love that Python is great for a lot of AI work, it's democratized, right? We're making it good for all gem, right. uh, devs, Java devs and others. Spring is still my love language. So how do we use Spring Boot, Java, and Spring AI, the new project, to build this sort of AI-enabled API? Well, you know, Richard, I like to talk fast and code fast and make production containers fast. So let's, let's do this. Fast. Let's build it. We're going to start here, okay, my friends? We're going to go to start.spring.io. This is my second favorite place on the internet. Can you guess what my first favorite place on the internet is? Is it still production? It's still production. It's always going to be production. Right. We're going to build a new application here, start.spring.io. We have a few decisions we need to very quickly make, some answers that sure. we need to provide. First of all, what do we want to name the service? I'm going to name the service service great because name. I'm really great with names. I love it. Thank you. I, get that from my father. Sure. My father was great with names. When I was a small boy, we had a small white dog, and my father named him White Dog. I mean, again, amazing with names. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, that said, my mom, she tells me all the time, she says, you're very lucky that I named you. And uh, yeah, that's probably true as well. Your name would have been Lamp. <laughs> we don't want to know. And then we have a choice about what version of Java to use. Friends, there's a lot of good choices, but Java 21 or later are technically superior in every way. They're also morally superior. Sure. This is very important. So we're going to leave that there as well. And then we have some decisions to make. First of all, we yeah. want the web support. We're going to build an API, it's right? An That's API. what we talked about. Right. We're going to use uh, the JDBC SQL uh, database abstraction, of course. Right. We're using AlloyDB, but that's binary compatible with? Postgres. Postgres, OK. And uh, we're going to use the GraalVM native image support. And GraalVM is? It's an open JDK distribution that has some extra utilities that allow us to build really fast native operating system binaries. Okay? Got it. And then finally, uh, where would we be without the Spring AI module for Gemini? You wouldn't be up here with me. That's true. Yeah. That's true. So, exactly. So that's the, that's the price of admission. <laughs> Seems fair. So we've got all of our selections here, but we're on the clock. I would normally hit generate and open this up in the IDE. Right. I've already got an IDE waiting for us. So let's just switch over to that. OK, and so here's the public static void main code that you would have gotten. I'm just going to copy and paste all of this. Right there. You code fast, but not that fast. <laughs> and we're gonna, we want to set this up for success in production. I'm going to enable virtual threads. Those are magic, right? That, they give you non-blocking I.O. without the complexity of things like async await and yep. the like. That's awesome. Um, Gradle W, I'm going to kick off a native compilation here, OK? We'll just let that run in the background. This is not a regular Java compilation. It's a GraalVM operating system specific com compilation. So it'll take a little while. Oops. Whoop. There we go. And take two. There we go. So we'll let that run in the background. And yeah, now walk back me through the code. Because what sure. you're doing is you're doing some of these things of calling the database, calling the AI model, all those sorts of things. Absolutely. Walk me through it. Pretty straightforward. Pretty much what we've seen, I think. I, at least I hope so. Yeah. So we start from here. We've got a method, uh, a, a method called recommend, given the current product that the user is looking at. Sure. And a query, a, a, you know, a question by the user, given that product. Um, we go to AlloyDB. We look up the other similar yeah. products, given the description, given the embedding. Doing a vector search there, you see Absolutely. in the command. Absolutely. Yeah. Very straightforward. Uh, and then we go, we go uh, down here, and we get the results, the similar products. We use that to then create a string, which we then plug into our prompt to Gemini to ask it for similarity, right? And that prompt template, that's a Spring AI component that works even if I'm swapping models and making worse choices and not using Gemini, but it would all work. Right, exactly, right. Yeah, exactly, okay. yes. So a nice little uh, toolkit there. And uh, then we send that off to, the, uh, to Gemini. It gives us a response. It gives us the ID of the product in particular. Yeah. We then use that to do one final lookup in AlloyDB to return the result that the user asked for. Now, now, if I don't have a Josh Long available, exactly, and I got handed this code, this I, could take me a long time to digest. 
you know, can we ask a little bit, of, get a little help potentially here? And, yes. Uh, ask Gemini for some help, maybe. So, we can ask it some, some questions here. Yeah, we have to hide our little window there. Yep. Okay, let's see, this down there. Nope, or maybe Gemini doesn't want to help me. There you oh, go. There go, sign into Google Cloud. Well, it's okay. I don't want to do any of those things. <laughs> so we'll go to the console here. It's run. It's already run. So let's show me, this is a super small binary, right? Right. So we go to the build directory, build native, native compile. I'm gonna run the program like so, yep. service. Up and running, there now you that, go. That started comically fast for a job application. Super fast, and it's uh, you know tens of megabytes of RAM and, and all that. And now nice. I wanna actually make the request, so I'll just uh, call the API that we just created. Yep. And we get a nice response. Look at that. Look at that, a nice leather chair. So this was actually using modern native Java to talk to a database, augment a request, and then give us back a lightning fast response. You can use Graal VM images, like Cloud Run and yep. containerized images. It's amazing. I love it. So all the things you saw today, this is legit ready to use tech to prove that RAG and these architectures are actually not that hard. We have a jumpstart solution you can use today that creates this RAG system in under 15 minutes, and you can try it out. So look, we covered a ton of ground here. We looked at how we can build agents and apps with RAG and LLMs. We got our app running in GKE, and we used some cool AI frameworks. So we are working to give you the most innovative and integrated stack for model training, serving, grounding, and more. Thank you, Kazlin and Josh, for a tour of this modern runtimes with AI. Thanks for having me. Love Bye, it, man. Buddy. Oof, tired just watching that guy. That was great. Uh, so let's talk more about this runtime and platform stage and how Gemini makes running apps better. Can you all join me in welcoming VP and GM for our cloud runtimes, Ken Goldberg. Hey, Richard. Hey. Thank you for being uh, willing to hang out with me today. I wouldn't miss it for the world. I know, that's why you're my favorite. Don't tell Brad. Um, Han, I think you have some things you want to show us, things you're excited about when it comes to Gemini, making platforms better. That's the second reason why I'm here. Okay. So, you know, Google runs billions of containers in production, and it has to be smart about how to run at scale. The same is with our customers, as they continue to create and deploy more and more software. We think AI can help us create and run modern apps. Maybe Jason can help us here again. He's good at that. Ah, already here. So let me maybe start with Cloud Run. Yeah. Cloud Run is an amazing service for running your applications and agents at scale and to innovate really fast. But we also heard some folks tell us, hey, can you make it simpler to bootstrap an architecture? And guess what? We did just that. Yeah, so you're talking about making it easier to spin up a complete service, not just one Cloud Run service, right? Exactly. Yeah. Look at this new canvas we are now shipping in preview. Using Gemini Cloud Assist, I can ask for the architecture I want and get back the right components with default settings, including the container image used for Cloud Run. See how I then configure each component here starting with my service where I can add my own image and then configure other components like my database and even load balancer. Nice. I can also use natural language to modify the architecture. Uh, maybe we should add a cache layer to my app. You're making good choices. Then we simply hit deploy and our application will be created on Cloud Run. That's awesome. This experience is helping developers to think in applications and manage them more easily. Super cool. What a great way for devs to kind of build out and explore a modern architecture using tools like this. I love that. And do you want to see something even cooler? You know I do. So we've just enabled multi-region deployment so that you can deploy this application globally. Wow. You can see here this single command in Cloud Shell. It's the regular one that everybody is used to to deploy services. But notice my region. I can deploy a Cloud Run instance to any number of regions at one time just by adding the regions I want uh, here. That's so cool. I love Cloud Run. I think it is the fastest way to any production workload. And I think no other cloud makes it easy to deploy to multiple regions like we do. Yeah, it makes two of us. It's definitely one of my favorites. That's good. You're not supposed to have favorites. Uh, so look, people also love having access to GKE, though, which is your other favorite. Uh, when they want to deploy platforms, commercial software, or just apps that run best on Kubernetes, when is GKE the right choice for AI workloads and don't say all the time? I wouldn't say that. Okay. But definitely when you want more flexibility and control, GKE got you covered. 
And, and you know, what's interesting is that with AI workloads, some of the new challenges that our customers are seeing now can uniquely be addressed through the power of GKE. One challenge is growing the ecosystem, uh, but really GKE can be easily integrated and extended. For example, we've added new support for the Ray framework so that you can train and serve AI models more easily with GKE. Yeah. Yeah, that's not easy to do if you've just done it yourself, right? No. If you've done it ever on your own, you might know the complexity and steps that you need to follow before you even get to the fun stuff. Right. The fun stuff. I, I like those stuff. Okay. <laughs> and you can see here that we just updated our UI to make it simpler to add Ray to GK cluster. It's a single checkbox, and we got you covered. That's super convenient. What else have you added to GKE that makes it this sort of ideal host for folks running their enterprise grade AI workloads? So, besides support for popular framework, uh, we've also introduced new support for TPUs, optimization for container startup time, and loading data faster, helping our customers to save money and improving developer velocity. All right, you said developer velocity. If it's on your bingo card, you got that. Uh, I'm thinking notebooks, though. Can I just use regular notebooks with this, or is there anything funky? I think this is a great idea, and of course you can. So here you can see that you can use Vertex AI Colab Enterprise Notebooks nice. with your Ray cluster. This gives you all the benefits of both GKE and Ray, as well as Colab Enterprise on Vertex AI. Here, we are running inference on our Ray cluster from a notebook. And if you want to hear more, you can join my Spotlight session today. You should not miss that Spotlight session. But as you mentioned, it's not trivial to build and run lots of containers. Day two is going to have to change as we cre keep creating more and more software. So what are you doing with AI to make operations in GKE a bit easier? That's a great point. So earlier, Brett showed us Gemini Cloud Assist. And it offers a very powerful way to use resource-away generative AI to run your cloud platform. And we are providing Cloud Assist across our cloud services. Let's see how. Yeah. When you activate Gemini Cloud Assist, you not only get contextual answers to chat questions, but also in-console recommendation for optimizing your clusters. Here in this example, I'm at our new cluster overview page, where we have surfaced more Gemini-generated insights to keep your clusters healthy and optimized. Beautiful. Now you can also go and view insights for my costs to see what I can do to help my monthly spend. Because Cloud Assist knows about my configurations, including regions, I'm getting targeted actions by cluster that can be taken to reduce my spend. I can then drill into the recommendations and even ask follow-ups for how to execute the steps, keeping humans in the loop just to validate. This is definitely one of the largest asks by developers in our community. And for optimizing GKE, see that Gemini is offering very specific recommendations in the GKE dashboard and help understanding GKE logs. I can't wait for, uh, yeah, being able to use this more and more. It's great. And you know what? Soon I'll be able to use Gemini to even act immediately on each of these. Wow. Bringing AI to GKE helps you build and run better platforms for your users. Thanks so much, Jason. Great job. So look, I love seeing how hard we work to make Google Cloud the absolute best place to run Kubernetes, and it gets that much better when you put something like Gemini in the mix. For sure. Containers are an ideal way to package modern software and AI-assisted container management platform with both GKE and Cloud Run offers you best option to boost productivity in the cloud. Yeah, couldn't agree more. So, Hen, thank you so much for helping us explore how Gemini and Google Cloud make platforms better. Thank you so much for having yeah. me. That was amazing. Chloe, back to you. We've talked about developing with AI and building powerful AI applications using developer tools. Now, let's take a look at how developers are using Gemini to manage and fix their problems in applications. Please help me welcome to the stage a reliability advocate here at Google Cloud, Steve McGee.
Welcome, Steve. Hey, Chloe. Nice shoes. Check oh, it out. Hey, thanks. Totally right. not planned. Yeah. A lot of teams out there are getting ready to ship their first LLMs to production, but might not know where to start or what's needed when they get here. Little help? Sure. As we build things like the RAG app we just saw, we now have a new operational control to consider, prompts. We always want to be improving our prompts, their text, their parameters, or which model they're built for. These prompts are written right into the code of the app. They are code. So today, teams tend to do this in a kind of an ad hoc way. They're just sort of trying stuff and discussing it in the team chat. Doesn't seem like the best way to keep things organized. I'm sure the best prompts could get lost in the shuffle. Right. So we want to help make this better and less toilsome. So you've heard the term prompt engineering. Uh, we can iteratively use prompt engineering to improve the reliability of our app, improving the prompts that are used in our code. Teams operating these apps should now be able to follow a loop like this. Detect the poor performing user interactions, extract examples of these poor interactions, update the prompts, and then compare the new prompt output to what was there before. Then we can deploy that new prompt safely using existing CI CD systems. Okay, so I could do all this in my notebook, but I imagine it's harder when working with a big team in production. Totally. That's why we're introducing these to Vertex AI, prompt management and prompt evaluation. Now you can see in real time how changes to your prompts are working, kind of like a before and after view. So let's see how this works in Vertex AI when a prompt is underperforming. So here we now have a my prompts view, and we're going to look at one here. It's just called, whoops, just called rugs. And I'm just going to switch tabs to speed things up a little bit. So here you can see you can edit your prompt, you can run it, you can see all of the parameters on the side, and here's the response. Can we understand this response? Is it really easy to diagnose what's going on? Mm, I think it could be a little better. Could be a little better, I agree. So here's our new UI for comparing prompts. We can add a new prompt. We call this like a new candidate. And I've pasted it in a new one here that's a little bit better. So the structure here that we've made it better with is we're giving it some context, we're giving it the job to be done, and we're also specifying the format. So instead of just this stuff at the bottom that our app needs, we're able to investigate it with all of this extra data, and we can see, yeah, this looks like it's making good suggestions, right? So we're able to determine if it's correct or not. And we have the scoring at the bottom. In this case, the fluency went up. This looks much better. This is like real English. A lot more context, a lot more information. That's right. So what do you think about this one? Should we keep this one? This looks great. Let's lock it in. Cool. So we can do this thing that's called use as ground truth. So if we set that, we can make a few changes if we need to over here and hit save. Now, if we look over on the left, there it is. We have our ground truth set, and we have a new thing here at the bottom. If you notice, there's a rouge and blue score. Those basically say, how close to ground truth are we? So the system will be able to build more responses that are closer to our ground truth over time. So I think we're pretty good. Should we ship this? Let's do it. All right, so like I said, we're just going to take the code and we're going to push it into production using our existing CI CD system. So we're, we're using Python here. We're just going to copy this and we're going to paste it into a repo and our CI CD system will pick it up and it'll just make it out into production and that's it. Great. So we have a history of all the prompt ideas and the best one is safely in production. Nice. So AI apps like this can produce emergent behavior, resulting in novel issues like we saw today. So teams need to be ready to adapt. In fact, there's an SRE prod verb that I really like. May all your incidents be novel. <laughs> Thank you, Steve. I think I know someone else who agrees with that. Thanks, Chloe. Thanks. Let's welcome to the stage a leader in the operations community and the co-founder and CTO of Honeycomb, Charity Majors. Welcome to Next, Charity. Thank you. I'm so happy to be here. Charity, you've been such a major leader in the software engineering community. So first, let's talk about your approach to observability, improving systems, and how that all shows up in Honeycomb. So Honeycomb, we make next generation observability tools to help software engineers understand the code that they write. It's really, it's about being able to explore whatever's happening at the intersection of your software, your infrastructure, and your users and being able to go from a super high level view of your system all the way down to very granular and precise details like every single user's experience. 
Is that why you've always been so adamant that observability <laughs> isn't just monitoring with a new name? <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. Our systems used to fail in fairly predictable ways. Uh, but this is no longer true. Our systems are, are dynamic and chaotic. They're, our architectures are far-flung and diverse and constantly changing. You don't know what users are going to do with your app. And the old ways of resolving issues just don't work anymore. So our tools help you deliver faster, higher quality user experiences, leaving you ultimately with more time to focus on your business instead of firefighting. Sounds pretty cool. How would I see this in action? Let's do this. <laughs> so you've already shown us applications running in GKE in a controlled environment. However, we'll need to add some chaos to showcase real challenges in observability. And how do we get some chaos? Users. <laughs> so, we wired up real honeycomb traffic to the Gemini model. And this right here that you can see is a stream of real user requests in honeycomb. We have this tool called Query Assistant right here that uses generative AI to create honeycomb queries so you can ask questions about your code using natural language like which users have the highest latency uh, and get back a relevant query and result. Even if honeycomb queries are easy to write, I have to imagine that natural language is even easier to write, right? Definitely. Absolutely. And this query assistant tool, like the thing that I just used, uh, was backed by the Gemini model for, for these. So we are looking at a record of real honeycomb users using the query assistant to understand their code, and we're now going to use honeycomb and the query assistant tool to debug problems people are having using honeycomb and the query assistant tool. So you're using Honeycomb to debug Honeycomb. It's very meta. <laughs> so like most people who have built and shipped products using LLMs, we've found that generative AI does an amazing job most of the time. When it doesn't work quite right, there's a very long tail of possible reasons why. Isn't it precisely the kind of problem that observability is designed to solve, dealing with the unknown unknowns? It is, yes. Observability is all about unknown unknowns. So we can't just jump to a log file because we don't know what we're searching for or looking for yet. So instead, we start with service level objectives. Uh, here we have an SLO that's an error budget uh, for one of our SLOs for Query Assistant. It's called availability. And this particular SLO uh, is one where we've instrumented the entire operation, all the way from when the user hits enter through the RAG pipeline, through programmatic prompt construction, the AI model call, response parsing, response validation, query construction, and submission to the query engine. And by the way, this is how we really do debug this feature in production. So it's a powerful feature, but there are a lot of places where things can go wrong here, yes? Well, that's the thing. Like, if you think about the flow that I just described, there are a lot of opportunities for error, and we haven't even started to get into all the ways that no one can break. I mean, a lot can go wrong, and, and we have no hope of knowing in advance how it could break. Makes sense. So how can I figure out what happened and what to fix? So as you can see here, we're currently producing a working query 95.6% of the time. Uh, for those of you who work in generative AI, that's pretty good. But I would like to understand the remaining 4.4%. Uh, uh, what's going on? So let's scroll down to the view where the magic really happens. Like we call this the SLO bubble up view. What Bubble Up does is it looks at every single query assistant request and it compares every single dimension um, between the requests that violate the SLO against the baseline events that satisfy the SLO and then sorts and diffs them so all of the differences bubble up to the top. Basically, it tells me what's different about the things that I care about. You're basically exploring here. Yeah, I don't know what the problem is, but we're getting closer, right? So I can see here that my error column is the most common outlier amongst the violating events. No surprises there. Um, but there are several different error values. Um, let's dig into one of them to learn more. Unexpected end of JSON input. Uh, that doesn't sound right. Let's use the query assistant to explore the responses. Uh, let's look at the responses, get those, and okay. So when I, oh my goodness, how do I scroll to the, does they change the mouse? How do we scroll? <laughs> do you know how to scroll? Yes, here we go. 
to the to the oh yes here we go <laughs> you're a genius thank you okay so when you look at the specific error it looks pretty clear that we are truncating the responses like that's not valid json right so now i'm wondering if our config limit is to blame let's look at the output config and go down and scroll to the right again Ooh, 150 tokens. Okay, so our configuration was just uh, for 150 tokens uh, for the response event from the LLMs. Clearly that's enough, because it's cutting these all off. So this seems like an issue that I should take to the team, right? So this, this whole flow just shows how incredibly important observability is when you're building with generative AI. We found this problem to fix, but new ones will surely come up. There are a half dozen other errors there already. <laughs> But when you can use SLOs, identify something that you find interesting, and then slice and dice and explore your data like this, you can really quickly get to the bottom of any issue, even if it's completely new and unknown to you. This really showcases how I can use observability in my new application. Here we've done a few things, shown you how you can better understand and adapt prompts running in production with Vertex AI, and learned about different failure patterns and how system observability can help us make our platforms better. Thank you, Charity and Steve, for joining us today and for sharing with our audience how AI is shaping modern ops and observability. Now I'll throw it back to Richard to introduce our final special guest. <laughs> Thank you. That was awesome. So let's talk about how Google and our partners are doing some pretty fantastic work bringing generative AI technology to you. We're going to pick one here. So please help me welcome the engineering manager at Hugging Face, Philip Schmidt. A long walk. Hi. Good job. Good to see you. You're doing so much to enable our developers and developers everywhere to use Gen AI. Thank you for that. Yeah, and we are excited to have Google open develop models available alongside powerful integrations into Google Cloud. Yeah. How about we jump in and I show you how to train and deploy models directly from Hugging Face to Google Cloud? I love that idea. Show me how it works. So we start here in our model hub, where we now have over half a million available models for developers to use. Look, one of our most popular models is Gemma 7B. At a model card, we find helpful information about how the model was used, how it can be trained. Yep. We can even see how well it does on benchmarks. And we can directly try it. Let's see what Murph is uh, her favorite. My name is Murph, and my favorite color is red. That's fantastic. Once you find a model you would like to train, such as Gemma, we can directly do this by clicking on Train Google nice. Cloud. Touching this option gives us call-up notebooks available in Vertex AI, where we can perform instructions, fine-tuning, or further train our model. I love that. So what if I like the model as is on Hugging Face, and I just want to deploy it. I don't want to train it or do anything else. If you directly want to deploy the model, we can select Deploy next to Train, Google Cloud. And then we are provided with two options. We can one-click deploy our model to Vertex AI, or get step-by-step -step instruction on how to serve the model with GKE and GPUs using Hugging Face Text Generation Inference. And we are pleasant to announce that we are bringing Deploy on Google Cloud option to thousands of Hugging Face available models. I love that. That's great. So yeah, there we go. That's awesome. Uh, so what if I'm starting in Vertex? So you started in Hugging Face. What if I'm starting in Vertex, but I want to use all of those types of models running there? What have, what have we done there for you? Yeah, so if you are starting in Vertex, we have a new Deploy from Hugging Face options. There you go. With hundreds of available Hugging Face models to select, deploy with tested configurations for Vertex AI and GKE. Yeah, yeah. that's amazing. All right. So, Thank you for showing us that, all of that. I've started actually using Hugging Face myself recently, and I'm, I'm hooked. So thank you so much for showing us all of this and being a great partner with Google. Thanks. All right. <laughs> all right, Chloe, that was pretty awesome. So many different demonstrations that put AI into context, right? Honestly, it's not about AI. It's about how AI makes what we do better. So. No one is putting AI into the center of the developer experience quite like Google is. Agreed. I learned so much from all our guests, but I wonder what the major takeaways are. Here's a wacky idea. Okay. Could we put this recording of the keynote into Gemini and ask for takeaways? That seems super stressful to the production team. Yeah, let's do it. So um, let's bring out Jason one more time. Is he killing it today? Jason Davenport. All right. 
Uh, Richard, I kind of had a feeling you were going to make me do this. Uh -huh. <laughs> you want one more time? Um, so what we did, we uh, took a good subsection of this. We took about 627,000 tokens worth of video from the first part of this keynote. Wow. So we chopped that. Uh, we got it from the truck. We put it into Google Cloud Storage. And now we're essentially running it in Gemini. So uh, what did we ask, Chloe? Looks like the first question here is how to build a brag with Google Cloud to help our developers build better grounded generative AI. Question two, what product does in console troubleshooting? Yeah, you're just pitching products here, Jason. Good job. <laughs> All right. Look at yeah. that. Look at the results. Yeah. So we Looks got some great. great stuff back. Those are pretty good results. So look, if you take away anything from this keynote today, it's the, from coding to running platforms to operations, software simply better with Gemini. Thank you all so much for being here today. Enjoy today's breakout sessions and stop by the Innovators Hive to try out all the latest tech while talking to your favorite Google Cloud experts. And we'll see you in the cloud.